We are continuing on in our series on why we say no. Today we're going to look at the, the idea of temptation. And this is one, you know, where, where you would probably say, well, most churches agree you should say no to temptation. And, and, and yes, that's, that's probably true. But there are some churches, and then most importantly, the ways of the world, which say um, it's okay to give in. To temptation every now and again. It's okay to, 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 to just, you're only human, right? You're only human. Uh, or, uh, as um, has become a catchphrase, the devil made me do it. <laughs> right? The devil, the devil made me do it. I did some research on that, on that phrase, um, and what I found, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong or someone, someone can correct me, because uh, I wasn't around when this phrase came into uh, popular culture is 1970s, so long before I was born. Long, long, long before I was born. The devil made me do it. Uh, Flip Wilson, is that the guy's name? Anyone heard of Flip Wilson? Is that his name? Never heard of him, okay. Uh, he, was, he did a, uh, a variety show on TV, and there was, uh, one of his characters was a woman named Geraldine, and every time her husband accused her of doing something wrong, such as you know, buying a too expensive dress or, uh, you know, driving the car into uh, an accident of some kind. Um, her excuse was always the same. The devil made me do it, right? Anyone watch that show? I need to probably YouTube that. Okay. A few of you. All right. Original. Original. So is it black and white or? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we grew up and I grew up listening, hearing that catchphrase. I've heard that catchphrase uh, many times. And the, the truth of the matter is it affects the way that we view the devil. And we need to view the devil correctly when it comes to our lives and how we um, respond to the things of the world and the things that we're trying to decide on doing or not doing. We need to understand the devil doesn't make us do a darn thing, right? Okay? Now, the devil's working to make us decide what he wants us to decide to do, but he is not the one who makes us do it. We believe, though, with phrases like this and the way that our culture has become, that sorry if I do, some un, like immovable force that is actually we cannot push against it hard enough. We can't move it out of the way, and because this force is right there and working on us, we have to do this thing that we really don't have to do. We imagine him as this little guy, right, on our shoulder, wearing the red tights unfortunately in most of those pictures that we have of it and the the pitchfork and the the, all that stuff whispering into our ear sitting on our shoulder and on the other shoulder is the angel right telling us the other perspective what we should do or should not do versus what the devil is telling us and in those cartoons that we watch those tv shows where people are trying to decide between right and wrong or the good choice and the bad choice which do they usually choose the bad choice. Almost always. Because it's funnier, right? It puts them into a situation that they have to get out of. And we like to watch those things. Unfortunately, I believe in our culture we've made that, too many people have made that a truth in their own lives. How they decide things. Let me weigh what's good and bad. And let me, what do I feel right now? I'm not looking towards the future at all. I want to know how is this going to make me feel right now? And we've got to get past that. We've got to get past this, this little back and forth and say, I know the truth. And I want to work towards the truth. And we, that, that's how temptation works. And, then, and the question becomes, is the devil really equally as powerful as God, right? If we're imagining the, the devil and an angel, maybe it's the devil and Jesus sitting on our shoulders. And is the devil as equally powerful in our lives as we are deciding what to do, Right? Teenagers, please listen to this sermon today. I don't, I don't want to see any eyes closed over there today. Is the devil equally as powerful? Do we give him equal time on our shoulder to say, you know, here's, here's the, the, the stuff I want you to do, and then we, we let Jesus have his say, and then we go back and forth. Are they getting equal time? And I think in our culture today, they do. And even in some cases, the devil gets more. And then we get to this point where we just say, I give up or I give in. 
And we've got to get past that. Can the devil make us do anything that we don't want to do? The short answer is no, he cannot. And Jesus made it clear that the the one who is in us, right, is greater than the one in the world. That's from, from 1 John. The truth is the devil doesn't have any power. He has zero power other than what we let him have. Amen? Do you believe that about the devil today? Because that sets the basis for all of this. If you believe the devil has even just a little bit of power over you, you will give in to temptations that you do not want to give into, or at least that you say you don't want to give into. And I have been there, I promise you that, as all of us have. And we've got to kick the devil out of our lives. Amen? All right. The devil can be persuasive, absolutely. And the closer we are walking to God, you've heard this before, the harder the devil is going to work to get us off track. If we look at, and we're going to look at Jesus today, the story of Jesus. Um, And Jesus, you know, he's he's going to be tempted by the devil. He's going to be uh, led by the Spirit even out to be tempted by the devil. And he's coming off of a spiritual high in the previous chapter. And there's no reason the, the Bible has, and, and people have studied this, how much time elapsed between when Jesus was baptized by John and the, the heavens opened up, right? And the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove. And God, from the voice from heaven, said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Spiritual high, right? Humongous high, awesome moment. And then the very next chapter that we read, the very next point in the story of Jesus, before he begins his public ministry, because he was just getting baptized, getting ready for public ministry, here in in the baptism part. And before he goes out and actually starts doing things, he's tempted by the devil. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, empathize but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin Jesus was tempted absolutely was tempted what do we need to learn from him and we're going to look at this story in Matthew chapter 4 specifically at how Jesus handled it when the devil tempted him and I'm here to tell you if you're facing temptation in the world today the devil's behind it The devil is working through your friends. He's working through your family members. He's working through stuff at school, stuff at work. He's working through the TV. He's working through movie theaters. He's working through the music that you listen to. The devil is absolutely at work in this world today. And he wants you to give in. And Jesus said no. And we need to learn how Jesus said no so that we can use that as our example. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Uh, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And again, I just want to stop there and point out, Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted. Okay, And we're going to look at a verse here in a little bit that says, uh, you know, it tells us God does not tempt us, but he allows us to be tested. Right? Does that that make sense? Um, God is not the one causing us these hardships, he's not punishing us, all those kinds of things. But we do need to be tested, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, I'm just going to pause and let that sink in, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of that temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, 
and the angels came and attended him. It's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful testimony of what uh, the power of the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. I've read um, before that this, uh, this was before Jesus' public ministry, and this test of his was not just to test to make sure that he didn't slip up. It was a test to strengthen him, right? Anyone who's done any kind of uh, working out uh, or cross-country runners, anything like that, practicing for a sport or music or all that kind of stuff, practice strengthens you, Right? You've got to be able to face and be challenged with this new obstacle to overcome in order to then actually overcome it when the time comes for that to actually happen. It's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a principle that we have got to absolutely be able to apply to our own lives. Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness specifically so that he could be tempted? Right? We've got to understand this. Why would God allow Jesus to go through that. James, in uh, chapter 1, verse 2. I think we've got that one, yep. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Perseverance is not just a desired quality for the mature Christian. Perseverance is an essential quality. And if you have not persevered anything, you don't have the quality of persevering. Right? Okay. If you have not gone through times in your life where you have been able to face temptation and to say no to that temptation and maybe you've had to say no to that temptation every day every hour for months or years or maybe it's been an even unidentified amount of time because it seems like it's been forever if you have not gone through that persevering you have not yet had the quality of perseverance and perseverance is an essential quality for the Christian to have so what that tells me or anyone is that we may be giving in without persevering. We may be giving in without persevering. And then you know what we're able to do? We're able to ask for forgiveness. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Right? Amen. Amen. I have myself too many times for myself to count. Given in without persevering through that hard ship of saying no to temptation. And then I have been on my knees Asking God to forgive me. Crying myself to sleep at night because I needed God to forgive me and praise God that he does. I want to persevere. I want to live a mature life that actually has the blessings of God above and beyond just my salvation. Praise God that salvation is awesome and we can have it any time, anywhere. God does not pull that back from us ever. No matter what we've done. We can still have that. I want more than that because God has promised more than that. Amen? He's made more than that available. So in order for me to do that and become a mature Christian, getting beyond my own salvation, onto my sanctification, and onto then being able to disciple other people, I have to get past persevering. Or I have to gain the ability to persevere in the face of temptation. God is going to do whatever it takes to produce this quality in us. We read, perseverance must finish its work so that we can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I really believe that God will do whatever it takes to produce that in us. Again, it has to be our choice to go along with God in that. Amen? Every teacher you've ever had has given you a test of some kind. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. One of two types of of teachers is usually out there. One, they're giving you the test because they want you to fail. They want to see where you're going to fail. They want to see what you don't know. And there's another kind of teacher that gives you tests so that you can reinforce what you already know. Right? I love with our Bible quizzers, I love, I love Bible quizzing for this fact. 
You can read and study and memorize and put it to, to, but then until you're asked the question, you don't really know if you know it. Right, guys? Does that make sense to you guys? You can read a verse, you can read 10 verses, and if I don't ask you any questions over it, you're going to forget it in a, in a day or two or week or whatever. But if I'm constantly asking you those questions, if I'm constantly checking in to see how well you know that, and it's not because I want you to get it wrong, it's because I want you to get it right, and I want you to be able to commit that further and further into your soul, into your memory, so that when the necessary time comes for you to call on it, you will be able to do just that and pass the true test, which is what God is wanting us to do. We absolutely, absolutely need to understand that God will test us. But that is in order to reinforce our abilities to say no to temptation. I want to ask the question, what is an area of your life where right now you are being tempted in? Is it better to ask God to remove the temptation? Or is it better to ask God to help you pass the test? Now, I'm not saying that if you are tempted for, you know, to, to, if, you, if, you, if you're tempted by chocolate, you shouldn't go work in a candy factory. But we realize that not every temptation can be easily removed, right? As adults, we've experienced this. Not every temptation can be easily removed. But God does provide a way out, oh, a way of escape for every temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. My favorite verse in all the Bible. So you may be praying for the wrong thing. You can pray for a temptation to be removed, but you may not be in a a situation where that's possible. So then you need to pray for your ability to pass the test of that temptation. If the temptation isn't removed, you need to pray for the passing of the test. The three temptations that Matthew recorded for us in Matthew chapter 4, they fall into three categories. First is the appeal to physical needs, right? This is like the base human desire. Jesus was hungry. The devil tempted him to make the stones into bread. So whatever, there any physical need that you think that you have, any physical desire that you think that you have, this is kind of in there. The second temptation was to take a shortcut. Right? Jesus knew that he needed to fulfill his father's plan. He had to go to Jerusalem. He had to suffer, be killed. The devil tempted Jesus to bypass all of that. And that he would be able to establish himself as an earthly king. To throw himself off of that, top, that mountaintop. The angels would catch him so that he would not strike his foot against the stone. Everyone would see it and everyone would say, Oh, you are! the Son of God. Let me give you this earthly throne. That's what the devil was offering Jesus, and Jesus knew that that was not what God had intended for him. Finally, the devil tempted Jesus with power. I will give you the kingdoms of the world if you will worship me. And and just so you know, the devil does have kingdoms of the world to give out. The devil does tempt us with the things that he has some control over. And that's a scary thought. Jesus responded to all three of these temptations with Scripture. <laughs> he, did, he did not say, devil, just give me a minute. Nope, not there. Yep. He didn't say that, right? He said, it is written. He had God's word hidden in his heart so that he would not sin against God. Psalm 119.11 is where he pulled this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I didn't hide my word in your heart so that I can prove to everyone how smart I am. I didn't hide my word in your heart so that I can just be proud of myself because look, I, I look at what I know. I hid my word, God, and I hid your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. That cuts me to my core. 
absolutely cuts me to my core. I want to know God's word. And we talked about this a little bit Sunday night. I want to know so much of God's word that I might not sin against him. As Christ followers, we need to be in God's word every day, not just pulling the Bible off the shelf, you know, in case of emergency or I'm bored today, so I'll get my reading in today. Paul described the armor of God, and this is we're going to look at the armor of God next week in detail. But Paul described the armor of God um, to the church uh, in, in Ephesus in the chapter in the book of Ephesians. He called the word of God the sword of the spirit, right? It is, an, it is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. And I love that. Swords are for defending, right? Defending ourselves from the attack. But the sword is also an offensive weapon. The purpose, and I, I, won't, I won't share more than that. The, the, we'll look at that next week. But the, the purpose of the armor of God, if we looked at Ephesians 6.11, is so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Oh, that's so good, right? You have an offensive weapon to stand against the devil's schemes. That's so you're not just some some person who's who's you know, let me just defend myself and defend myself and defend and keep backing up and backing up and all of a sudden you say, "Okay, I give in." You have a weapon at your disposal that can strike a blow to the devil. Whew, amen. That's awesome. Like that's it doesn't get any more real than that. We have to understand that the word of God is the primary way that we defeat temptation. We cannot rely on our own strength. Anyone failed relying on your own strength and giving in temptation? Okay. That absolutely is the case. When we resist the devil, and this is verse 11 of chapter 4, uh, when we resist the devil, the devil flees and the spirit strengthens up. In Matthew's account, it says the angels came and attended to him. In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse three, 13 of Luke, it says the devil left him um, until an opportune time. That, wow, that, like, that's a whole different thing because the devil's not going to give up. You resist the devil, he is not giving up. He's going to come back again and again and again. The promise we have from Scripture, though, James chapter 4, verse 7 says, uh, if we resist the devil, he will flee. That's a promise from God. Anyone that's read that Circle Maker book, I hope that this is a verse that you've got in your Bible that you've got circled, highlighted, underlined, whatever. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Might be for just five minutes, but he will flee. And you do it again. And you do it again. And you do it again because we long to be mature Christians, persevering, because that is God's will for us. Fleeing is something that someone does when he is on the run from a superior force. I looked up the definition. It was pretty cool. Fleeing from a superior force. The devil is a coward. He picks on us when we are feeling weak. He turns tail when we show that first sign of strength. And he knows that there are plenty of other easier targets that he can pick on. And he's going to wait for that opportune time to come back and visit us again. We stand strong. We stand firm in our faith. The promise of God is that his Holy Spirit will help us in our weakness. For Jesus, that was the physical presence of angels that came and attended to him. We have that same promise from God that the Holy Spirit will be with us in those times of weakness. I still remember uh, my sophomore year of college. I was down at Mid America, and our our dorm, um, all, uh, guy guys dorm, and uh, midnight every single night um, we would get together and for a, a small group um, just reading some scripture and pray, and and. Some nights got very no. We had we had one guy on the floor who's a, he was actually a football player for the for the school, and he was he is he's a he's a youth pastor now. Uh, he was gung ho. I mean, gung. He came into Mid America as one of those um, kids who was not a Christian, 
when he came into the school, but he was recruited to play football in Mid-America, and he became a Christian. Praise God. Uh, and he, sophomore year, he was just, all, he would go midnight, and he'd pound on door. He didn't care. Even if you had told him, dude, I'm not coming, I'm going to sleep, he'd pound on your door and make you tell him every single night that you were going to sleep and not coming to uh, prayer time together. Uh, kind of a jerk, but he got the job done. Uh, <laughs> But he would, and so I, there was one night though he came and knocked on on all the doors. We're we're in the in the in his room, and, pray, and we get to this Romans chapter eight verse twenty six, and it talks about God being with our weaknesses, and we had this huge discussion, and it was just amazing to watch these eighteen, nineteen, twenty year old guys explain how weak they really are. I mean, some of these are football players, basketball players, and then say how weak we are. And it was such an interesting thing for me to experience watching that. And then one, of, well, then one, one guy who ended up kind of blowing the doors off the whole thing was not a basketball player, not a football player. He was about five foot four and maybe 95 pounds, right? And he, college kid, and he's in there, and he, he, he never talked, never talked. And finally, he's trying, he tells us a story about how his mom died when he was like 13 or 14 like that, and he felt so weak through that time. And he got to this, and he said, this passage is, I said, I had, I've been thanking God for my mother's death since I came across this passage for several years now. And in thanking God for my mother's death, God has made me strong enough to handle my mother's death. And he's like, it's, it's, it's been amazing how many other people whose parents have died that I have been able to talk to. It was like, it was, our minds were, you know, again, we're 18, 19 years old. Minds are blown. You know, this kid is saying this stuff. And even now, still today, it's, it's t- you know, I, as a pastor dealing with, with people who have lost loved ones, to be able to say, can you thank God for this thing that has happened? Not because you're happy that it happened, but because God is going to produce in you something that he desires from you and that he will give you the strength to accomplish it was an amazing testimony that I, I learned a ton from just in that moment. Thank God for our weaknesses. Yours probably isn't as dramatic as that. Maybe it is. But whatever your weaknesses are, God wants to be strong for you in those weaknesses. And that in turn makes you strong. Amen? How do you resist temptation as we close up here? We've looked at the most crucial element, I believe. It's just, it's the scripture. It's knowing God's word and hiding it in your heart. It's an offensive weapon. If you don't come on Sunday nights or you're not in a group that that gets together and talks, if in your family maybe you you talk about some things and husbands and wives, kids asking parents, that where you can apply God's word in your life daily, I encourage you to find a way to do that. The second way to resist temptation is to understand how temptation works. We are tempted when our desire, and I want you to imagine here with me, our desire, we're, on a, we're, on a, we're coming up to a, a, four, a four-way intersection. Our desire is traveling, right? And here's over here this car of opportunity, and it's coming this way, and they're going to collide. Temptation is when desire and opportunity intersect, Okay? Desire, opportunity, they intersect, and we have this temptation where we have to make a choice, okay? Always happens at that intersection. When you feel the desire to sin, you can ask God to remove the opportunity for you to give in to that desire. When you have the opportunity to sin, you can ask God to take away that desire, It can be either one of those two prayers depending on whether or not you can actually remove that that opportunity from you. And what I have learned myself when desire is involved and we need to change our desire or our heart's desire needs to change or we need to have God's desire for us replace the desires that we have in our heart, that's not always an immediate thing, right? So desire is a process to change that. Uh, There are times I think we can have an immediate change of desire. God can work that way. But also, God wants to test us, to reinforce our perseverance. And so if we have desires 
that are contrary to the word of God, we remove the opportunities to give in to those desires, right? Cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, all that kind of stuff. Because it's better to miss a body part than to experience the fires of hell, right? Okay. God will always provide a way of escape. Are you looking for it? Are you looking for your way of escape through temptation? Teenagers, temptation's going to come. Are you looking only at the temptation? Or are you looking for that way out? The sign that we have on the, 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 the thing out there this week says sin is too stupid to look beyond itself. That's when you see the temptation and you don't look anywhere else but the temptation and you're so focused on that sin that you can't do anything else but give into it. Adults, we've been there, right? Look for the way out. God will provide that way out. It may be that you can get yourself out of the situation in which you have the opportunity to sin. It could mean uh, arranging the computer so that everyone can, can see the screen in the room. It could mean having an accountability partner that you call every night. It could be uh, changing the, 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 the route that you go to or from work. And on the other hand, you may not have the ability to avoid the opportunity in which you desire temptation. In that case, we ask God to remove the desire. We ask him to create within us such a desire for the things of God that the things of the world pale in comparison. As I said before, I, can, I, could, I, I, could, I could go try to get the biggest mansion possible in Davis County. Well, there's some big houses out there. I guarantee it pales to what God's mansion has for me in glory. God's way is better. Temptation is real. The devil is working, but we can say no. Amen? And we should say no. We all know we can. We all know that more often than not, we, we do say no. And I'm thankful for the times when we've given in and we can still ask for forgiveness. And God will forgive us. I want to get past that. I want all of us to get past that so that we can experience not just God's saving grace, but the more than that that he has promised us. Sanctification and then the ability to disciple those around us. The more we say yes to temptation, the less witness we have for Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? I love you all very much, and I'm grateful that you're here. I pray that today, the message that you've heard uh, from God, that you would change how you look at the decisions you make, and that when you come face to face with a temptation, that you would be able to say no, and that you would begin then to order your life in such a way so that either the opportunities to live out that desire are less and less, or that God will actually diminish those desires within your heart. You've got to ask him to do it. And you've got to attempt, make real attempts at living that out as well. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how good you are, how awesome you are, how wonderful you are. And Lord God, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this week as we go out from here. I believe that as the devil knows we've heard this message, he's going to give us opportunities to say yes or no to temptation. He's going to be sitting on our shoulders, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that we don't just turn to the other shoulder to see what Jesus had to say, but that we would actually open the word of God, tell the devil to get out of our lives, and live according to the word of Jesus Christ and of God the Father. Father, bless us this week. Bless our families and our friends. Bring us back together again. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. I have loved you from the start I have seen your hurting heart